So I welcome you all to our very first meeting of Breast and Endocrine Society of Western UP as I'm Dr. Shweta Agarwal. I'm a clinical and a radiation oncologist at uh, KMC Hospital uh, Meerut. So without wasting any uh, time, I would like to introduce you to our speakers for today. Dr. Sudhi uh, Agarwal Kamboj, ma'am, who's a consultant and head of Department of Breast and Endocrine Surgery at Nutima Hospital Meerut. Dr. Chani Jain, who's MD pathology, consultant pathologist at Shastri Nagar Diagnostic Center, Meerut. Dr. Meena Bambi, consultant radiologist at Healthcare Imaging Center, Meerut. Dr. Reena Tamija, uh, she's a consultant nuclear medicine physician at Meerut Scan Center. I would also like to uh, introduce our esteemed and well-known uh, guest faculty for today and thank them to take out their precious time for us. Dr. Yes. Gaurav Agarwal, sir who is a professor, Department of Breast and Endocrine Surgery, SGPJ Lucknow. Dr. Rahul, Dr. Rohan Khandelwal, who is a consultant breast surgeon at CK Birla Hospital, Gurugram. So uh, now let's uh, begin with our first case discussion, in which I would like to mention that the pathology and radiology reports are not uh, reported by our speakers. So uh, we'll start. With I, I think, uh, am I audible to everyone? Okay, fine. Like, I cannot hear. I, I understand. Thank you. And uh, before starting, uh, would like to mention that uh, uh, in between, if anyone gets disconnected due to any reason, uh, they can very well reconnect us uh, by just uh, mentioning their meeting ID and the passport. They do not need any uh, 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 this uh, uh, host uh, uh, involvement. And secondly, uh, uh, following the meetings, uh, when we finish both our cases, the forum will be op uh, will be open for an open discussion. And by that time, the other participants will be held mute. They can post their uh, questions, if any, in the chat box, which Dr. Shweta, who is the moderator of the session, will take up and uh, will ask the to the speakers and the guest faculties. So, with that, I would like to start. With our first case, who was a 35-year-old premenopausal lady, multi-parous lady who delivered... Uh, Ma'am, please start sharing your screen, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. So... Actually, uh, it's not coming up. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry uh, for this technical, uh, these technical errors. Uh, we are new to this technique, and I hope that with, uh, with time we will be able to be like more uh, confident in using it. Okay, so am I audible, uh, Shweta? Yeah, yes, ma'am, you're audible, and your sh uh, screen has started to share. Thank you. So this was a 35-year-old premenopausal lady, multiparous, delivered three years back, currently non-lactating and uh, who presented with a FNAC proven lump in her right breast, which uh, uh, was noticed around two to three days back only. And uh, uh, on clinical examination, she had a lump in her right breast in the upper extreme upper quadrant, uh, far away from the nipple areola complex. Uh, she did not have any high risk family history or personal history. And on clinical examination, no other lumps were palpable. Uh, in both the breasts. So she seemed to be looking at her younger age, she seemed to be a very fit candidate for a breast conservation surgery. And to facilitate that surgery, along with the metastatic workup, we asked her for MR mammography to better characterize the lesion. But to our surprise, uh, in mammography, we found something. Dr. Meena will tell. Uh, MR mammography revealed multiple in both breast uh, and uh, with few of them like at least three of them appeared suspicious on right side and one of them appeared suspicious on left side showing type 3 uh, enhancement curves hello yeah uh, the next slide huh. you can ask for a next slide hmm. yeah MR winnings uh, have been uh, narrated in short. Okay, so basically, if I can summarize this whole report, 
So ultimately, we got to know that she did not have only a unicentric malignant lesion in her right breast. She actually had bilateral, multicentric, highly suspicious lesions. So uh, she also had a PET scan in that duration, and which also confirmed the finding. We could, we could see a, a, a highly malignant lump in her right breast, and there was suspicious lump in her left breast also. So uh, looking at the and uh, this, this, this is the, uh, the scout film, and we can appreciate this was the main lump which, which she presented. And there were other multicentric uh, uh, focal lesions uptake were there, which were highly suspicious. So clinically, she uh, was having a malignant lump in her right breast with highly suspicious lumps in the left breast. So we had an FNAC repeat, which on the right breast, uh, it was positive for malignancy. But uh, ultrasound guided FNAC of left breast showed epithelial hyperplasia with a moderate atypia. Okay, so uh, she had a, a, a CCT upper abdomen done due to some reason done elsewhere, and uh, which showed an ill defined area of hypodensity around 10 into 8 into 24 mm in the right lobe of liver. I'm sorry, I don't have the images right now. But why I am discussing this, uh, why I'm putting this. Uh, uh, a CT scan report that I will tell later. So the case was discussed in detail with the patient and the attendant. And because of the multicentric disease, the breast conservation surgery was absolutely ruled out. And uh, because she had a suspicious lesions in her left breast also, we gave her a few options. Like either we can go for a left breast lump biopsy and can wait for the histopathology report, which will come in around three to four days. And uh, uh, for a single definitive surgery and then go for a single definitive surgery. Secondly, either we go for right MRM as planned because the attendants and the patients were very apprehensive. They just wanted the treatment to be started as soon as possible. So we opted, we offered them, we can go for right MRM with left lumpectomies with possibility of redo surgery if left breast, left breast lumps comes out to be malignant. Or we can go for right MRM with left breast lumps under observation or right MRM with left risk reducing MRM with implants as an alternative for a single comprehensive procedure. Okay, so they uh, found it more valid. They opted for bilateral MRM with bilateral breast reconstruction. We initially put the uh, silicon uh, this tissue expanders and later on uh, replace them with the saline uh, with the silicon implants. Okay. Her post-operative period was uneventful. But again, when the histopathology report came, we were again surprised. So Dr. Chani, I request to please elaborate this report. On histopathological examination for right MRM, grossly, uh, it was reported they found three lesions. One was at 5 to 7 o'clock, around 8 by 7 by 3 centimeter, and adjacent mass 1.5 by 1 centimeter and a gray white area at 11 to 12 o'clock position. And on microscopic examination, ma'am, next slide, please. It was found to be an infiltrating ductal carcinoma, grade two, and the lymph nodes were clear. There was no metastasis. 29 lymph nodes all were negative. Okay, so- And the left uh, MRM revealed uh, there were just vague grayish white areas, which on uh, microscopy, it was found to be benign breast channel and no carcinoma or pigeons or anything was suspicious was found on left side. Okay, so uh, if again, we summarize these two reports, on the right side, uh, there was a malignant lump with no lymph nodal mass, but they did not mention about the multicentricity. And on the left side, there was, it was non-malignant. There was no malignancy at all. So we had a personal conversation with the pathologist and as a surgeon, I went to, we went to the, uh, uh, the pathology as well to see what was the mistake, where we went wrong, why the report is not concordant with the imaging findings. And uh, unfortunately, we did not find any uh, cross nodular lesion in the uh, contralateral uh, breast. And we were not able to find out whether it was the report is right or the imagings were right. So we are still in dilemma, but still we took the patient on a high risk site and considered her as having a bilateral breast cancer only and treated her accordingly. And uh, the histo the ISC was also done, which showed ERPR was negative and her to was acute vocal, 
which came out to be positive on fish staining uh, on fish amplification. Uh, she received a four cycle of CEA followed by docetaxel four cycle. Trastuzumab was offered but was declined by the patient. And to be frank, as uh, because having a, a small T1 to 2 lesion with no lymph nodal involvement, much not much emphasized by the physician as well. Uh, she was uh, uh, radiation therapy uh, consultation was sought and she was considered uh, uh, that she did not require any adjuvant radiation therapy looking at her uh, histopathology report. Okay, so the patient was doing absolutely well. The surgery, the initial episode of surgery was done in 2018 and she was doing absolutely well. Her follow-up scans were also normal. No problem anywhere in the body and she did not have any problem except for that she had irregular menses. Okay. So uh, we had so her hormonal evaluation then we showed her hormones in the perimenopausal phase, neither frankly postmenopausal nor in the premenopausal, but in the perimenopausal phase. And her other in investigations were normal. Uh, everything was going fine, except that in January, December 2020, she had a medical termination of pregnancy at uh, nine months of gestational age. And uh, uh, she had some weight gain from 65 to 75 kgs approximately 10 kgs in one to two years. Recently, when she visited us and because uh, she her uh, annual follow-up scans were uh, pending, we asked her for simple ultrasound abdomen. And uh, to our surprise, the ultrasonologist reported uh, something uh, unexpected. Doc I request Dr. Meena to describe. Yeah, uh, uh, ma'am, you are not audible. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello, am I audible now? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Two ecogenic lesions were reported in both lobes, which uh, uh, gave, uh, which gave the which appeared to be like hemangiomas, but definitely in a case of a known case of CA breast, uh, CT was advised to uh, rule out possibility of metastasis. Next slide. Yeah. See, on CT report, triple phase CT was done. On CT report, no lesion was could be detected on the left lobe. However, in one lesion in segment seven of right lobe of liver showed typical characteristics of hemangioma, which appeared normal on plain film shows nodular enhancement on arterial face showing and uh, showing typical centripetal enhancement pattern appear to be hemangiomas. Complementary MR was also done. ADC, the lesion did not show any restriction on ADC. The radiological findings got in favor of hemangiomas. Okay, uh, uh, but uh, she had uh, this because she is a known case of a breast cancer. Yeah, definitely. So definitely, the uh, we tried for uh, the lesion was tried for FNAC, but it was too small. So uh, the possibility of metastasis cannot be ruled out in this case, and uh, follow up uh, is required. But definitely, the, the uh, on the radiological imaging point of view. The page, matlab, the lesions uh, appear to be benign. Okay, uh, so uh, when we went through the uh, images again, uh, just uh, for the sake of the notice, we noticed that the lesion was reported on CT in the posterior aspect, where on we had a PET scan done, and we showed a lesion on the uh, anterior aspect. I request Dr. Reena Dhamija to please describe this image. Yeah, Dr. Reena, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, this uh, FDG scan, which was done post-operatively, that also shows some lesion in the liver, especially in uh, segment three and five. They were uh, hypodense lesion. Uh, we have drawn uh, SUV max over this. That, that shows uh, 6.3. But still, uh, these are more in favor of benign because... Uh, uh, they, they are uh, they could be uh, focally dilated uh, biliary radicals also or hemangioma these two uh, uh, possibilities will be uh, there 
that needs follow up okay so uh, these were the further images and uh, uh, so overall uh, everyone every imaging finding was in favor of hemangioma so why we chose this case for discussion in this forum because we wanted to discuss about no more about the probability of malignancy in a contralateral breast incidentaloma in a newly diagnosed breast cancer patient what could be the best possible surgical approach in such case if it could be anything else what what we have described the probable causes of radiological and pathological mismatch this we wanted to uh, understand uh, what could be the best possible adjuvant treatment in such cases the probability of liver lesion being malignant uh, the features of hepatic hemangioma with, are these uh, features really corroborating with the findings that we are getting and the best best possible follow up plan in such cases so when we reviewed the literature what we found that uh, uh, if any lesion uh, which is taking up the uh, which is taking some up which has a good uptake on pet scan uh, focal incidental pet fdg uptake in breast occurs in it is very less less than 1.79% but if this uptake is there then there is a high probability of malignancy in 36.2% cases therefore focal incidental fdg uptake in a breast should always be given appropriate consideration followed by further relevant clinical investigation so even though the uh, the uh, pathological report was negative but still based on the pre operative findings the investigation those lesions had very high probability of having memory i would have considered using dual anti her2 blockade that is pertuzumab along with trastuzumab and a good regime to use is tch or tchp that is taxane with carboplatin and with trastuzumab alone or trastuzumab plus pertuzumab so that's the ideal or the most uh, appropriate uh, systemic treatment but then you have patients who cannot afford any part of this treatment or you are compelled not to use any part of this uh, treatment because of various uh, uh, comorbidities the patients may have if patient has a serious cardiac comorbidity of course he would not like to use uh, cardiotoxic medications and both trastuzumab and pertuzumab are cardiotoxic uh, pertuzumab to somewhat lesser extent compared to trastuzumab uh, but nonetheless it is indeed cardiotoxic uh, another thought process which has emerged over recent years and and which also reflects in uh, the fact that if you are using tch or tchp uh, you omit use of anthracyclines altogether and and that is because on, or that's based on the fact that in patients who are hormone receptor positive anthracyclines have a greater role to play in er pr negative her2 new positive cases you can omit the anthracyclines and that's save the patient of the cardiotoxic uh, effects of anthracyclines and straight away bank on the combination of taxanes with anti her2 therapy or taxanes with a platinum agent and anti her2 therapy so that's as far as uh, the ideal treatment is concerned you also discussed about how do we interpret or how do we evaluate for liver lesions uh, well uh, correlating ct findings or ultrasound and ct findings with pet scan is one way to go but eventually the gold standard remains histology or at least cytology so in this scenario as in when possible we should do a, a image guided needle biopsy for cytology or preferably for histology and uh, then uh, depending on that we we take the uh, further course of action and in in fact i and you, you did also discuss about what is the best way to follow these patients this patient uh, uh, i am presuming the patient was at worst pt2 and 0 disease multicentric hormone receptor negative but her2 positive and 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 so uh, a while on account of being young patient at 35 years age and hormone receptor negative or two positive she belong she had some high risk features but stage wise she is low risk because she has no negative disease 
and T2 at worst. So I would put her in intermediate risk category. A patient who has early stage cancer, intermediate risk category, I would follow the patient only with clinical means, that is a good uh, thorough clinical uh, history and examination, physical examination once every year, along with the most basic investigations, that is serum chemistry in form of alkaline phosphatase and calcium levels, and a, a mammogram of the contralateral breast. That's as much as I would like to do. And certainly not subject the patient to annual uh, whole body PET CT. Now, when we do these, evalu these, these imagings or this, uh, these investigations, we are faced with more and more challenges. And, and specifically, if I may just take a step back and talk about MRI, in, in my own experience, MRI throws up more problems than solutions. Uh, whereas MRI is supposed to be a problem-solving tool, it's, it's certainly not a screening tool. It is a diagnostic tool in selected patients, but more often than not, we all believe that MRI should be used as a problem-solving tool. That is, if in case you have inconsistent or or uh, non-concordant imaging and pathology, then you can use MRI to provide further information about a particular lesion or multicentric multifocal lesions. Here in this case, you were, I would say, you were sent on a wild goose chase due to the MRI. The MRI showed multiple lesions which did not exist. And so it it's, it's only underscores the fact that there are a number of false positive findings that you can, uh, uh, you can be, uh, confronted with when you are doing MRIs. So I think I have addressed some of the issues that you asked me to. If there are any, if there's any other issue which I have left. Thank you so uh, much, sir. Thank you so much for your comments, sir. And now, uh, can we uh, have your comments, Dr. Rohan, please, on the particular case? Thank you for having me in this uh, forum. Uh, I think, uh, sir, has covered pretty much uh, everything. I do have uh, certain points uh, to make, though. As uh, Sir mentioned, uh, the ideal situation in these patients would be to do an image-guided core biopsy beforehand. But as Dr. Sudhi said, that the patient uh, wanted uh, treatment to be started as soon as possible. And uh, we do encounter a uh, few such patients in our uh, private practice as well. So, um, you know, one thing which we also need to understand as practitioners, as private practitioners, with the amount of litigations which are happening, proper documentation of uh, these things are very important uh, so that it doesn't come back to haunt us later on. And uh, second also is that uh, we can utilize a frozen section if the patient is not desirous of a core needle biopsy. A frozen section uh, can be done intraoperatively to see what the nature of the lesion is. And you can take your consents accordingly if it is positive for malignancy or negative for malignancy. So that is uh, one thing. The other thing, of course, uh, which Sir did mention is regarding the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Because uh, I saw the two histopathology reports. So to get uh, 20 odd lymph nodes on one side and 30 lymph nodes on the other side, we will uh, the patient will invariably land up with lymphedema, which affects their quality of life as well. So uh, a sentinel lymph node biopsy, spe especially on the other side, uh, could have um, you know, prevented uh, a full axillary clearance for this uh, lady. Um, also, I mean, um, we yeah. debated the issue of uh, doing risk reduction mastectomy on the other side, although that, as Sir said, could have been avoided had we done a proper core needle biopsy beforehand. Um, Maybe if the patient uh, knew that the lesion is definitely non-malignant, uh, they, they wouldn't have opted for mastectomy. Even otherwise, if they would have opted for mastectomy, uh, I feel uh, uh, we could have done a nipple sparing mastectomy on the other side as well, if we were uh, so desirous of the cosmetic uh, result in the end. Uh, even on this side, on, on both the sides, a nipple sparing mastectomy would have been an option because we were doing a reconstruction for this uh, patient. Uh, the choice of reconstruction is something, again, which um, I, uh, I have some reservations about because, uh, you know, we did not um, FNA the lymph nodes beforehand. Um, 
and we didn't know the lymph node status because we did not do an intraoperative sentinel lymph node in a frozen section. What if the lymph nodes had come out as positive and the patient required radiotherapy? Then it would have been problematic with the implant reconstruction. So, um, I mean, I would be a bit uh, careful about doing implants uh, where I'm not sure about the lymph node uh, status. Um, you spoke about the pathological discordance and, you know, whenever we get a patient who has bilateral lumps, uh, we always think on the lines of lobular histology and uh, uh, we would have uh, taken another opinion from another pathologist regarding uh, uh, lobular histology as well, which can come with bilateral uh, breast cancers as well. Um, then one uh, so another thing is um, i would have offered she was a young patient um, she could have been offered a brca testing as well which um, you know would have um, given us more information as well so that is something which i would have offered to the patient uh, regarding the uh, treatment for such a patient or her to new positive patient with multicentric disease there were multiple lesions which were approximately 2 centimeters in size uh, she would have been an ideal candidate for neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy with a dual her to new uh, therapy, that is Herceptin and Pajeta, um, which is what we offer to our patients if, if I would have got such a patient. But because surgery was done beforehand, as Sir mentioned, there is no role of uh, adjuvant pertuzumab. The data on that is still not that robust. So um, a T she, considering that she is... Uh, 35, so TCH uh, would have been a good uh, choice for this patient. Radiotherapy, we already discussed that this patient did not um, require because the nodes were negative. Uh, I do agree with the uh, sir completely that you know regular PET scans is not the way forward and it can uh, uh, give us confusing findings like the ones which you found in the, the, in the liver. Um, if there are uh, hemangiomas which are reasonably sized and if we can uh, FNA them, that would be the best way to go forward. If not, I would just man um, monitor this patient with a regular CT or an ultrasound, but not a PET scan. So I guess those are the points which uh, I wanted to uh, make in this case. Okay, uh, so uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, you. Uh, both uh, of you, sir, and Dr. Rohan has made very valid points. A few questions just I want to just based on my practical, uh, uh, on my practice, exactly. In how much time, suppose a patient comes with a lump. We don't know what lump it is it. So what exact investigation in your OPD, the patient has visited for the first time with a lump in the right breast, in any breast, uh, 35 to 40 years of age, premenopausal. On clinical examination, we are not sure. Uh, it is neither uh, clear-cut fibroadenomatite nor clear-cut uh, malignant lesion type. Then what is your approach in such, what investigations you prescribe? And if you prescribe for core biopsy, in how much, many days you get the result? Uh, so I would do an uh, ultrasound for a 35 to 40 year old, and that would be uh, done immediately and um, if it is a birads uh, four or four or five lesion we would do an ultrasound guided biopsy i have uh, an ultrasound in my chamber so i would do my ultrasound guided biopsies or a palpation guided biopsy if it's a big big, big enough lesion and we get our reports in three days uh, including the ihc markers Achha, including ihc marker you get the report in three days so three days. So I think, uh, so since we are not sure whether it is a malignant lump or not, uh, we first ask for a histopathology. And if it comes out to be positive, immediately ISC markers are advised for that patient. Yes, so I think so. It is very important to discuss with the patient that even if as a clinician, I feel it, I know it's a, it's a malignancy. Uh, so we have to explain to them, uh, you know, they once the malignancy is diagnosed, the anxiety levels soar and they think that it should be removed immediately. But we have to explain to the patient that that lump, if, if it's a two, three centimeter lump, it would have been, it would have taken months to form. So uh, two, three days is not going to, uh, you know, affect their treatment in any which ways. So it's always better to go for a co-needle biopsy, get that result along with the IHC markers 
and then proceed because you know these days there are very set indications for neoadjuvant chemotherapy based on the biology as well so uh, we would always wait for the ihc markers before uh, proceeding for uh, surgery or for the treatment okay uh, just to share uh, right now we are struggling with the uh, getting the result early uh, right now the turnover time from core biopsy to the result to the till the ihc report is around uh, 7 days in our city so we are just working on it to uh, make it more feasible so that we gradually shift to this core biopsy and uh, secondly uh, so would like to have the comment I, ji sir i think dr gorav wants to say something ji sir please yeah I've, two two comments come to my mind firstly you are fortunate that you're getting all this information seven within days. a span of 7 days which is i mean exactly. perhaps the best perhaps the best anywhere in the world uh, uh, but let me just forget about everything and and give me a more philosophical you can call it advice i can advise you if you don't mind uh, or sharing my own uh, practice with you i know that you are in a different scenario where i mean none of us like to lose a patient to another colleague a patient once she is there with you you want to treat her but then you want to treat her to the best best of your capabilities and it takes a long hour of counseling for the patient and the family members to make them understand why you would like to wait for those few days or few or even more than a week before you initiate treatment and i do lose a few patients it fortunately does not make any uh, uh, uh any ch- difference to my financial uh, uh whatever for good being but i do do not feel good about losing those patient but i feel it's better to lose a few than to be caught doing a wrong treatment on a patient and then stand in a court of law answering all the uncomfortable questions uh it will come with time you'll have to have this acceptance of losing a few patients while doing the right thing so what i do i tell these patients that your treatment needs to be started at the earliest but not in a haste there is a difference between early treatment and hasty and so possibly wrong treatment and you can pick up you can choose your own way to treat more often than not patients do understand this and i tell them these few days are a good investment into choosing the right treatment and and perhaps um, you also do the same but but maybe you can do it more you can you can devise some more effective ways of counseling these patients and making them understand that we have to do the right things to get the right results then only we will do the right treatment and once in a while you lose the patient who would choose to go to some other person get treated in a haste and perhaps at times get treated wrongly but that wrong treatment has not been done by you so i think that that's the message i would like you to leave i to leave, i would like to leave you with yeah thank you very much sir uh, so one thing would like to uh, understand like suppose uh, in a frozen section biopsy what do you counsel to your patient he uh, i will be sending this frozen section biopsy what is the percentage of having is uh, true positivity and what is the percentage that the report may be negative but later on in a definitive histopathology it will turn out to be positive in that case the patient may require research so any such counseling do we what what uh, uh, tata do we quote okay so now frozen section done for a patient uh, who has inconclusive histology or preoperative histology that's the scenario you are talking of uh, i almost never very seldom use this path anymore this used to be a practice until some years ago but maybe our pathologist have become better our radiologist and we ourselves have become better at getting the right tissue and arriving at a correct or accurate preoperative diagnosis uh, and as a result we are not 
no longer we require using frozen section for decision making decision making whether the the lesion is malignant or benign and in in such scenarios often i am able to counsel and make my patient accept that we will simply excise the lesion subject it to histology and if there's a need we will have to revisit and do the right thing if, if in case any additional step is required mostly these lesions are small which are inconclusive and so you are able to do a wide local excision and my practice is any such lesions where there is even a remote possibility of finding malignancy i would do a proper wide local excision orient the 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 uh, uh, specimen for the pathologist to assess the margins and report the margins so in case this does turn out to be malignant you do not have to revise the margins in more often than not you would not have an infiltrated margin all that you would require to do in that uh, predominantly involving the upper predominantly involving the upper central quadrant of uh, right breast and uh, there was thickening of skin and subcutaneous overlying uh, thickening of skin and subcutaneous tissue the lesion uh, appeared to be abutting the right pectoralis uh, muscle but however no definite invasion noted uh, could be commented on this mammography film next slide the mammography uh, mr mammogram was done for this patient and it revealed a large solid cystic lesion with uh, uh, irregular margins predominantly again involving the upper central quadrant of right breast however extending to the uh, lower uh, inner and quadrant also and it was involving the pec it appeared to be abutting and involving the pectoralis major as well as the overlying skin सैंपल and the smears from the uh, firm area revealed groups and sheets of malignant cells suggesting of infiltrating ductal carcinoma uh, the processed fluid showed degenerated inflammatory cells and red blood cells so dr chani will tell about the images uh, we received a trupad biopsy after 3 days and on microscopy it showed a malignant neoplasm in the form of infiltrating pods and even tubule formation the nuclear and cytoplasmic features all suggestive of a ductal carcinoma next man further it was followed by immunohistochemistry which showed positivity for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptors and a complete membranous staining for her2 new which showed her2 amplification and k67 index was around 20% she had a pattis staging pattis scan done and we show a localized lesion uh, dr reena will tell about uh this uh, fdg pet scanning it is showing a uh, right breast lesion that uh, sumx was 12.6 along with this uh, axillary lesion also be seen that uh, in right axilla itself that was also likely metastatic there is uh, there are other lesion which can seen in rib which was in fifth rib it was uh, not that much hot or uh, avidity uh, of uh, fdg in that lesion but could be metastatic so that was the finding since she had a locally advanced right right breast cancer with an isolated solitary uh, uh, though doubtful skeletal mass uh, we labeled her as t4b uh, uh, n1 uh, sorry uh, with an isolated skeletal solitary mass uh, following an echo which showed a normal ejection fraction of 60% uh, she received a uh, three weekly cef four cycles followed by texins four cycles uh and uh, uh, along with the three weekly trastuzumab and azolotronic acid but after showing uh, promising results initially uh, she gradually stopped showing any 
uh, response with the therapy. And when we finish with the uh, NACT regime, on the repeat assessment, post NACT assessment, uh, we had her repeat mammography done. And Dr. Meena will tell the details. Sir. Uh, <clears throat> Please unmute yourself. Hello, Anji. Yes. Uh, repeat mammography done in February 2022 showed again a mass, uh, uh, mass involving the upper central and uh, extending to lower central quadrant also. If we compare between the two lesions, no significant interval change or rather increase, there is was mild increase in the size of the lesion. Okay, so this was the PET scan that was also repeated and uh, uh, Dr. Reena Dhamija uh, will uh, describe the details of this PET scan. Okay, this PET scan also shows increase in the uh, SUV max of the right uh, breast lesion and uh, that was earlier was 12.6, uh, now it came to be a 14.5 and right uh, axillary lesion also was there that was also suspicious of metastasis. Other, no other lesion was uh, same. Okay. And I also, see. if we can notice uh, the initial cystic lesions, they were now turned into all solid lesions. So there was no cystic cavity uh, following this uh, chemotherapy. So uh, as compared to the previous scan, there was an increase in the size and the metabolic activity of the right breast lesion. However, there was a decrease in the size, number and metabolic activity of the axillary lymph node that was reported. Uh, now, since her uh, chemo regime was completed and uh, the lesion was still globally advanced, uh, we, uh, uh, we offered her uh, MRM and in the surgery, we covered the, the uh, defect with the ipsilateral LD flap. This is the gross of the uh, lesion and Dr. Chani will describe the gross and the microscopic images. So on slicing the grass, we found a variegated mass, which was around 7 into 6.5 centimeters. And there was a small hemorrhagic cavity also. So we took the representative sections. Next. On microscopy, the findings were a little surprising because we found sheets of malignant squamous cells. As we can see here, polygonal cells are there with central irregular hypochromatic nuclei. There was squamous pearl formation also and dyskeratitic cells also. So the conclusion was a metaplastic squamous cell carcinoma, which was stage T3 and N0, nodes were negative, and the skin and base were free. Then we went for immunohistochemistry for pro, uh, predictive markers. And as expected, the tumor was negative for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptors. Next one. As well as HER2 amplification was not found. KIE 67 index was significantly high, around 70 to 80%. So uh, post-operatively, uh, she received adjuvant uh, radiation therapy. And uh, she recently completed all the therapy. And uh, her trastuzuma, which was being given earlier, is now stopped. The patient is under close observation. So why we chose to discuss this case? Because we know that metaplastic breast cancer is a very rare cancer. and since we have encountered this case, in this forum, we just wanted to discuss about this case to know about the probability of transformation of ductal cancer into metaplastic cancer, the risk factors, the treatment prognosis, and follow-up of such cases. So Dr. Chani will, uh, uh, will review the literature. Dr. So, uh, Chani, yeah. WHO has defined metaplastic carcinoma as a carcinoma which encompasses a group of neoplasms characterized by differentiation of the neoplastic epithelium into squamous cells and or mesenchymal looking cells. So differentiation from a glandular to a non-glandular type. These neoplasms may be either entirely composed of metaplastic elements or a complex admixture of carcinoma and metaplastic areas. So common features which we uh, find, it is commonly a mixture of epithelial and mesenchymal components. Less than 5%, it constitutes less than 5% of all breast cancers. Pathological diagnosis can be challenging at times. 
it is usually locally advanced and it lies along the spectrum of basal like carcinoma bis that is more than 90% of them are triple negative it has been reported that infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast could progress to metaplastic scc after induction chemotherapy as has been mentioned in some case reports lymph node metastasis is significantly less frequent in metaplastic carcinoma distant metastasis can be seen preferentially if they affect brain and lungs it has worst come outcome as compared to a triple negative idc and five year survival rate is 50 to 70% it has twice the risk of recurrence shorter disease free survival and overall survival as compared to a triple negative breast cancer next ma'am okay so uh, when we dis when we try to find out like uh, the uh, uh, what are the various theories uh, what are the probable causes of uh, uh, developing a metaplastic breast cancer we came to know that these are the biphasic tumor uh, meaning they have the presence of sarcomatous and carcinomatous component within the same tumor uh, within the same tumor so there are various theories proposed one is the collision theory which suggests that carcinomatous and the sarcomatous tissues are derived from separate progenitor cells so there are progenitor cells uh, everywhere in our body uh, in breast the uh, both types of progenitor cells they are mutated and uh, become carcinogenic and they cause the cancer uh, while the combination there is a monoclonal origin theory which suggests that the common multipotent progenitor cell is responsible for giving rise to both sarcomatous and carcinomatous cells so a single type of cell is uh, producing both type of cells mesenchymal as well as epithelial and uh, there is a conversion or metaplastic theory which suggests that sarcomatous component is derived from the carcinomatous component via a metaplastic process like uh, uh, ductal component is converted into a mesenchymal component and the evidence to support this metaplastic theory comes from the data that should epithelial and mesenchymal component of the tumor dip, display a positive expression of cytokeratin s100 and bimentin so there were certain markers which were positive in both the cells which which give an idea that probably these type of cells are the metaplastic transformation sarcomatous cells are the metaplastic transformation some of the cells are transformed some of the cells remain the same okay so it is further been suggested that the metaplastic breast cancer may derive from the myoepithelial cells as the tumors are frequently positive for myoepithelial markers like cd10 p53 and smooth muscle actin so these these markers may help in find out uh, what is the exact theory like are they related or unrelated so the management uh, because it is a triple negative disease uh, somewhat like basal uh, cell carcinoma uh, the treatment is like a triple negative disease conventionally like a triple negative disease but the outcome is poor compared to a triple negative disease so surgical treatment is the first choice and uh, then the radiation therapy uh, in uh, uh, chemotherapy the uh, uh, the uh, use of carboplatin and the combination of carboplatin and paclitaxel is being recommended and uh, since uh, newer and newer uh, uh, studies are going on it has been found that right now there is no currently no standardized treatment guideline specifically for metaplastic breast cancer however prior studies have found that metaplastic breast cancer typically has molecular alteration in epithelial to mesenchymal transition amplification and epidermal growth factor receptor like pic ac uh, signaling nitric oxide signaling wnt beta catenin signaling altered immune response cell cycle distribution and some of the uh, 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 some of the receptors are under study for target uh, for some newer molecules and hopefully uh, uh, in in, uh, in uh, recent future we may be able to have some specific medicines for such type of tumors so dr chani okay uh, we came, i came across certain case reports for there where there was a change of pathological type to metaplastic squamous cell carcinoma during the disease recurrence so for instance in this i'm next slide 
so this patient was initially diagnosed as infiltrating ductal invasive ductal carcinoma and went for ma ma breast mass resection and sentinel lymph node biopsy she received four cycles of chemotherapy and then radiotherapy but after two years of follow up again there was a disease recurrence and which proved out to be a metaplastic squamous cell carcinoma next one one more case was there with the of a metaplastic squamous cell carcinoma of the breast where the patient initially on core biopsy was diagnosed as a infiltrating ductal carcinoma and she was started with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and after the uh, reduction in size they did a repeat biopsy and on repeat biopsy it was found to be a metaplastic squamous cell carcinoma so uh, would like to have a comment from the experts uh, to share their experience and uh, how can we in a better way manage such type of cases dr rohan can we have your comments please as you pointed out metaplastic cancers are usually triple negative cancers uh, but unlike triple negative cancers which respond very well to chemotherapy uh, metaplastic cancers don't respond that well to chemo um, we are routinely using carboplatin and pacli or nap paclitaxel for uh, our patients with triple negative cancers so there has been some response um, there is a patient uh, of ours who's metaplastic where uh, i know pembrolizumab was also used and there was some response to pembrolizumab as well but again this is all anecdotal data the numbers are not there uh, to you know clearly define that this is the uh, guideline to treat uh, metaplastic cancers uh, in a metastatic patient uh, like this um, my you know with a metaplastic metastatic cancer it would be more on the lines of uh, palliative care and um, i would have only offered like uh, i could see that there is impending ulceration or impending uh, skin uh, necrosis which was about to occur so the, offering a toilet mastectomy at the, that stage is all right uh, but other than that if it's a metastatic disease um, just palliative care and you have to explain to the patient that the prognosis is uh, not very uh, good uh ngs uh, next generation sequencing in such patients works very well because you get to know all the mutations and the possible treatment options which you have so if the patient is affording an ngs would be advisable okay uh, so dr rohan just uh, need your comment or is there any role of uh, because most of the patient that we have encountered like this patient with prosheta has one patient and uh, the few case reports which dr chani has described majority already had a chemotherapy in the form of some nuclear translation so could be a possibility that because of chemotherapy the transformation might have occurred or it is the you know something unlikely no i think so it is uh, got to do with sampling which is why uh, you know if we are doing core biopsies we make sure that i at least get uh, six seven good cores um, with a 16 gauge uh, core biopsy needle uh, from various areas of the tumor because uh, you know it can be a sampling uh, error as well where actually, not adequate uh, the sampling to i am sure because true cut i myself take for my patient and this is also my strategy to take as much true cut as possible at least 8 to 10 good cores so that pathologist does not say he i don't uh, is not able to report just because of an inadequate sample the pathologist must have an adequate sample because uh, it hardly takes once the patient is the local areas and aesthetics it hardly take, uh, takes anything Uh, so, and we had uh, I, i did not show in this presentation but we had an another opinion also from another pathologist because that was a bit surprising and idc yeah, converting it the lesion the image which you showed was such a big lesion that you know practically it is not possible to biopsy all areas yeah now if if there is a uh, if there is a metaplastic component in one of the areas and we miss it um again but let's let's think um, otherwise let's not uh, deep dive into just the diagnosis otherwise also it would have been a triple negative cancer even if it would have been a metaplastic cancer still your treatment would have remained the same in such a patient all of us would have used neoadjuvant chemo and then we would have uh, proceeded after that now this was clearly a patient where there wasn't um, where there was progression uh, to say on 
after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So in such a patient, when there is progression, you would also you will have to carry out a, a palliative surgery. You send out the tissue. And these are the cases where next generation sequencing really helps because you actually get to know what are the mutations and what are the actionable mutations where uh, treatment options are available. So what would you have preferred as a primary uh, chemotherapy drug line in such patient? A patient with ER, uh, uh, she was negative. ER, PR positive and uh, her two mu positive. She, so triple she, negative we usually give um, uh, Pakli Carbo is uh, what we start with. And, um, you know, after assessing of, of four cycles of Pakli Carbo, we will see uh, the response and then we will decide for the, for the course of treatment. Like for the patient, when she had an initial crew cut where uh, the report was IDC and ERPR positive, her to new was also positive. In such case, uh, in a locally advanced lesion, what is your... If it was her to new positive, ma'am. Uh, so initially, if you're talking about this case where you said it was her to new positive, ERPR was negative at that time, right? ERPR was positive, sir. Positive. ERPR, her to new positive. So she was hormone receptor positive. So just want right. to... So, Oh. So in such a case, if I know that it is a metastatic disease, this patient would have initially been put on uh, paclitaxel plus uh, Herceptin and Pergeta if the patient could have afforded, afforded uh, pertuzumab. And uh, after four cycles or uh, six cycles of uh, giving uh, Pacli for this patient, we would have repeated a PET. If there was response on the PET, we would have continued with Herceptin and Pergeta and then switched her over to hormonal therapy. Okay. So, Peclitexel, Pergeta, and Trastuzumab. This is your preferred line. Yeah, in such cases. That's nice. And, uh, uh, in fact, it is better to document all these things. So, what I'm realizing in my practice routinely is that with such ever-evolving guidelines and new medicines coming up, we should mention it in our um, in our prescriptions because uh, there are a lot of litigations which are happening. In fact, there's a patient where uh, in a corporate, in a particular big corporate hospital, the patient in the consent form, patient underwent a mastectomy and in the consent, there was a column of alternate procedures explained. They did not write breast conservation explained. And that patient later on, one year later, they did a case on the surgeon where they said that, uh, you know, breast conservation was never offered to us. So we just have to be more careful about documenting this. Even if the patient cannot afford Pergeta, we do write down that uh, this has been discussed with the patient. Okay. And uh, one thing actually regarding the last case, uh, uh, that time, yeah. because of time constraint, we were not able to uh, just want to ask about your experience you repeatedly you frequently sent for frozen section biopsy so how do you counsel your patient what is the positivity rate what is the uh, uh, chance of reoperation such type of cases because because you so must I do tell counsel that uh, with the pathologists i've been working with the same set of pathologists for the last 9 years now so mm -hmm. i'm reasonably confident and i know that um, 97 to 98% of the times they will get the right thing so we do write down in the consent form that there is a 2 to 3% discordance rate in the frozen section. And just in case there is a 2 to 3% discordance rate, like Sir mentioned, if, if I'm uh, doing a frozen to see the histology, to confirm the bio diagnosis, then we go wide, we leave clips in the cavity. So just in case it turns out to be DCIS or IDC, I will have negative margins and the clips are already there for the radiation oncologist. If it is Dr. For, Sudhi, uh, yes, sir. I, I want to add something here. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, is doing, pathologist uh, in Meerut? Say, yeah, regarding, la, la, regarding last case which we discussed, I am doing frozen for last five years. Actually, the, the frozen, everything is possible. Frozen positive, histopositive. Frozen positive, histonegative. Frozen negative, histopositive. But in that case, we can counsel the patient because the lesion is too small not for primary diagnosis. We can easily take out the, you know, the uh, wide excision, send to the pathologist. If, just forget the primary diagnosis. If it is positive or negative, we can see the margins, do the sentinel lymph node and leave the breast as such. Even the primary is, because the gross lesion is very small. So, 
even if the frozen is negative or positive, that will serve our purpose. We see the margins or the wide axis and do the central lymph node biopsy and leave the patient. In my opinion, that would be the you should offer to the patient because she was the young lady. Abhi wo baad mein kabi nahi kehne wali ki main jaldi mein thi. Don't go according to the patient. We have suffered many times. Patient ek dam apni baat badal dete hain. Take your own time in making the diagnosis. Okay, so my pre-operative uh, assessment for her case was that even though these lesions, since they are showing very good uptake on PET, it, it takes it, it takes me forty-eight hours to do a needle biopsy reporting. Mm -hmm. Take your ever take your own time for pre-operative workup. Don't go by choice of the patient. Don't be in haste. हम उसकी एक ब्रेस बचा सकते थे इजीली. उसकी वाइड एक्सीजन करते. Primary diagnosis नहीं भी बनती. Even then, if the margins are negative, because the lesion is suspicious and very small, we do the sentinel node biopsy. If they come no negative, then we leave it as such. Okay, sir. Uh, actually, because the report was not very well clear on the uh, on the screen, uh, she had multicentric lesion in the left breast also. Okay. All were suspicious with the type three curve. So all were uh, so supposed to be biopsy. We should we should do the core biopsy first, at least. She we was offered. Document. She was offered, sir. All the options she was offered in detail in right. ये लोग ना बाद में पलट जाते हैं. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally understand. So everything was put on right in writing, and uh, yeah. uh, 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 detailed informed consent was taken from them. And the option was the uh, what uh, what exact. Uh, as, uh, as, as per Dr. Khandilwal, as per I, I have seen myself. In two, two to three or four percent cases. In frozen, everything is possible. Frozen is mainly for we use mainly for margins, but in pri primary diagnosis, it happens. Frozen is positive, histo is negative. Frozen is negative, histo is positive. That is in in four to five. You have to explain the patient. It is yes. this chance we can take this chance. So around three to five percent, I must say, that there is a chance of a positivity or negativity. This causes yes, yes. yes. In 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 frozen and in histo biopsy. Okay, and what about sentinel lymph nodes? What is things which you have to be careful about, Doctor? No, no, no. I, I, I have never seen any discordance in. I have never seen personally any discordance in frozen and histopathic report. Okay, so uh, in sentinel lymph node, if it is uh, positive on frozen section, it is a positive. If it is negative, positive. it is negative. Okay, it is no, ma'am. No, that is not the case. We've seen multiple cases where it has been reported as negative initially. and then you've come back with positive notes on final histopathology or you've come up with micrometastasis yeah. or isolated tumor yeah, it can happen it can happen it can happen so, what, is, so what, what i'm what saying as as surgeons two things which you should be careful about yes if you're doing a frozen for diagnosis go wide and mark it with clips so that the chances of getting positive margins are less and if you don't get positive margins radiotherapy will always take care of it and if you're doing a sentinel node if the sentinel node comes out as positive you always have the option of irradiating the axilla as well but this needs to be explained to the patient that there is a 3 to 4% discordance rate and you might land up with a negative node on sentinel might turn out to be positive of course with the acosox z11 trial with the amaros trials we are not doing anything wrong even if the node does turn out as positive you can always offer radiotherapy to them and that should be good enough okay so even if the central lymph node come out to be positive uh, you don't uh, operate but irradiate the axis to operate ma'am radio amaros clearly says that even if i don't operate uh, radiotherapy is good enough and acosox z11 says that even if you don't give radiotherapy then also there's not no problem so why why we have 10 years data also now yeah, we have why we operate the in these patients Okay. Yeah. So, Shweta. Uh, yes, ma'am. Let's just uh, finish with the talk. Thank you, everyone, for uh, giving your precious time. Thank you, Rohan sir. I Thank think uh, Dr. Gorav has already left. He was getting late for something. He had he okay. had a commitment uh, uh, somewhere, but I'm uh, very grateful to sir that uh, he is. I know his schedule. So, uh, he is uh, he is a super busy person, and he is the. Uh, 
chief medical superintendent also of SGPJ, so looking after that office also. And uh, uh, despite that, or uh, even on my single call, intelligent remarks. He, he accepted my invitation and uh, took the pain to uh, attend this meeting. And uh, uh, I am very grateful. And I simply hope that uh, uh, today is the starting. And uh, to be very frank, uh, we were, at least I was a bit nervous about the starting because this is the forum which I wanted to start for past many years. But uh, maybe due to many apprehension and I'm, because of uh, many reasons, I was not able to do so. And today was the first meeting, was our first meeting which is successfully conducted and I'm, I'm very, very happy. Uh, we deliberately so because of me, you ma'am. <laughs> and I deliberately kept it as a very low profile you meeting. Made a lot I mean, of efforts for that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Shita. Uh, I deliberately kept it at a very low profile. Uh, just yes. so that like, uh, and I have told my um, core members also that initial three to four meeting we will just keep to... Uh, 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 to uh, uh, make ourselves more confident, to break the ice, so that we lose our lose our uh, this uh, uh, loss of confidence, and uh, we we gain more confidence and regularity in conducting such meet, rather than having a very huge meeting and uh, not doing good in that. Uh, so, small small mistakes, we will not get disheartened. <laughs> and uh, 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 this was the even month, and we had our breast meet. Next month is the odd month, so we will have our endocrine meeting. The things are fixed. On the last Friday of May, we will have our endocrine meet, and we will have two interesting cases in that. And before that, I will try to involve the now the physicians into that. Okay, and uh, so please keep your date reserved. Uh, don't uh, take any. Uh, uh, if it is very, very important, it's okay. Otherwise, try to be free on that day so that we all attend the meeting in large number. And most probably, uh, we will have more attendance. Uh, we will involve more people and we'll learn more next time yes, about the endocrine cases and subsequently about the breast cases. And please keep your cases ready. If you feel you want to discuss any case, please keep all the records, make a presentation. Please let me know. I would love to hear from you all also. I will invite uh, uh, the other participants uh, to share their cases so that we learn. We, uh, yes. Because the repeated discussion will help us change our strategy. The medicine is an ever-evolving branch. What we came out from our institute, uh, that thing is in 10 years has entirely changed. So we need a continuous learning program an informal one, a semi-formal type, so that we don't have any hesitation and we come forward with more and more questions so that we can evolve our practice. And with this, I would like to thank you all. Thank you everyone for giving your valuable time, especially Dr. Rohan Khandelwal. Uh, he's very busy and a very kind person. I, uh, we uh, meet him, uh, like we recently uh, started knowing each other and I know that he is a very good person, not as a surgeon, but as a person also, he's a very good, uh, very knowledgeable, and we learned a lot from him. Thank you very much. So should I uh, should I uh, uh, close this meeting? Yes, ma'am. If anyone wants to yes. say anything, I think uh, Nagar sir is with us, uh, the participants. Uh, but Nagar sir has left, you know, almost all. Okay. Thank you very much.